Welcome, Welcome to, to Hero, Hero Club. Club. I'm Nick Williams. And I'm George Primavera. George and I started playing Dungeons and Dragons with our buddies in college, and we haven't stopped since. Even when we lived on opposite coasts, I would Skype in George on the TV in the living room of my apartment, while I would DM from the floor of my bathroom so as not to wake up my roommate. When I finally came out to Los Angeles, we started playing with our friends right away. And when we'd inevitably tell other people about the ultimate betrayals and daring heroics that happened in our games, we realized that they were just hearing a jumbled mess instead of the cinematic blockbuster memories that were in our heads. We wanted to show people how fun and immersive D&D can be, especially those who had never played. And to do that, we record a full game like normal around the table and then painstakingly cut it down from four hours to a clean, math-free episode so you can experience our memories the way we do. Just like in a real game, nothing is ever written or planned out ahead of time with the play. The only things we add are music and sound effects. I am the dungeon master. I build the world and the framework for an adventure. The players, like Nick, must then journey through the obstacles I set before them, rolling a 20-sided die and adding character-specific bonuses to see if they succeed. If they beat the number I have in my head, then their action is successful. If not, it is a failure, and there may be consequences. We try to follow the rules of Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition as close as we can, but as the Dungeon Master, what I say goes, and there are some things I like to do differently. Each season is its own contained story, so find one that sounds interesting to you and start from the top. And hey, welcome, welcome to, to the, the club. club. Hero Club presents Chains of Atlantis Act 3 Craters in the Earth October 1914 Amidst an empty blue sky above a sea of dark clouds, the tiniest shining gray dot approaches from far, far away. The whistle of the thin whipping wind is soon joined by the humming of a propeller and soon drowned out by it as the dot grows larger and larger. A silver bullet of a biplane, clearly in terrible rusty condition, clumsily shoots forward. The biplane is marked by great big letters that spell the phrase, Fuck the Wright Brothers, scrawled sloppily in black paint wrapping around the entire craft and seated in the open cockpit is Bones Mahoney. Bones's greasy shoulder-length hair and massive box hedge beard whip behind him in the open cockpit. His already threadbare clothes, the gray cardigan, long underwear, and Levi's jeans are now practically falling off with wear. The bags under his eyes have turned a dark plum. He leans outside of the cockpit, trying to sight down towards his target, Bravegate Manor. Where's this goddamn house? Bones, exhausted, peers over the side. Make a perception check with disadvantage. Eight. The cloud layer beneath you is thick. There is no seeing past it. The only thing to do is to dip below and see what you can see then. Bones pulls the shawl collar of his cardigan up around his neck and pushes the yoke of the plane forward, attempting to dip beneath the clouds. Suddenly soaked through, Bones descends. Make a constitution saving throw. 23. You shake off the biting cold that tries to nip at you through your threadbare clothes and come out over the English countryside. Make a perception check with disadvantage once again. 7. Bones is circling above the English countryside for over an hour. Bones reaches deep into the patchwork back pocket of his jeans and pulls out a greasy old map of Europe, trying to decipher where Bravegate Manor would be. Let's see here. Uh, all right, it's, I don't think it's in Cornwall, wherever the hell that is. Bones, make a survival check. Eight. Where the hell is this place? Bones circles for another 45 minutes. As you fly aimlessly, searching for Bravegate Manor without success, your eyes flip to the fuel gauge, which was very specifically designed for a transatlantic flight. But you are now slowly creeping over the gas tank's capacity. The dial approaches E. Ah, oh, Bones, you goof! The gas gauge! Bones specifically searches the horizon for any urban centers. Bones, frantically looking around, make one more perception check with disadvantage. 
16. Through the thick sheets of rain, you see the tall buildings of London poking out far on the horizon line, and use that skyline to reorient yourself. Now we're cooking with gas. The plane banks west, and soon you find yourself over familiar countryside. Bones descends over Bravegate Manor. Bravegate Manor is now deeply unkempt, hedges growing wildly, vines snaking up the side of the mansion, weeds sprouting from between the laid stone of the steps. The patch of land that you have once landed aircraft on here is overgrown with wild, tall grass, but you're able to find it despite the obscuring foliage. I don't remember it being such a rinky-dink operation. Bone sights the runway and goes in for a landing. Make a piloting check with disadvantage. 17. As Bones descends, we cut inside Bravegate Manor, where two masked figures exchange blows with long fencing swords. Not this time, Gov. Ah, excellent riposte, Miss Pickett. Bloody good form. I dare say you're improving. In the middle of this bout, Theobald, your ears perk up. Over the rain falling against the glass outside, you hear a propeller's engine, descending closer and closer to the lawn. Theobald throws up his rapier to parry Jade's attack, but doesn't make another move, and holds up his other finger, listening carefully. Could that be? Theobald rushes out of the room, scrambling for a window. The big glass windows open as if they are doors, out onto the back patio, just in time to see the silver plane make a bumpy landing in the back lawn. Immediately, you recognize Roiklin Wright's handiwork, and it's a short jump to determine that the pilot, with a hulking frame, must be Bones Mahoney. Odin's Raven. Theobald takes a deep breath, feeling a deep mixture of excitement and trepidation. The leaves begin to blow more ferociously suddenly. Nickelback! Nickelback! Nickelback wheels into the room with a blanket on his lap. Sir! It's Mahoney. He's landed in the yard. What? Mr. Mahoney is here? That bastard dare show his... We've got to get him inside, man. Post haste. Yes, sir. Of course. I should retrieve the claw, just in case. See that you do. So, the American returns. Theobald rips off his fencing padding as he rushes down the stairs to a side door and throws it open. Jade follows closely behind Theobald. Theobald waves wildly at the figure getting out of the plane. Bones, get inside! Quickly now, man! Bones, you see Theobald screaming over the wind and another figure a bit shorter in a fencing mask that you do not recognize. You are in danger! Make a perception check with disadvantage. Seven. You are not able to make out what Theobald is yelling at you. Bones, stealing himself emotionally for this moment, takes his time grabbing the bindle out of the back seat of the plane. Bones, make another perception check at disadvantage. 17. As the trees bow beneath ever-pushing wind, growing stronger and stronger, you feel the hair stand up on the back of your neck. Something is watching you from the woods. This is not the first time you have felt this feeling since journeying from Montana to Bravegate Manor. It's the hay man. Bones, make a dexterity saving throw. 18. A bolo made of chains suddenly flies out from the woods. You bend backwards, avoiding it as it falls uselessly in the grass. And a yellow eye, a pinprick in the distance, suddenly glows from within the darkness. Run! It's the hay man! Jade beckons wildly with her hands. Bones rolls backwards to standing and is already sprinting towards Bravegate Manor, using his moxie to stick and move towards the door in a zigzag pattern. Bones gets 45 feet from the plane, still 35 feet away from Bravegate Manor's door, and whizzing through the rain, fired from the darkness beyond the tree line, are two black barbed arrows. One of the arrows goes wide, landing in the dirt next to you, but the other one sticks into your back. You take 14 piercing damage, bringing you down to seven points of health. But as the arrow sticks into your back, you feel something at the point of the wound. Make a constitution saving throw. 25. Before what's clearly poison can seep into a system, Bones yanks the arrow out with a twist and a squelch. Ah, Oh my god, poison! 
Bones takes 13 halved to 6 poison damage, bringing him down to one single point of health. Not today, hey man! <laughs> Bones barrels over the threshold, falling flat in the doorway. Jade quickly goes to shut the door. He's gonna come in! He's, he got into my house! He'll, he's gonna be right behind us! He's, uh, he could be anybody! He could be any one of us! Bitch, Just like bitch. he was Ollie! And, Mr. Mahoney, and that Mahoney. hobo on the train, and, Calm and yourself, that man. shop clerk in Des Moines. We know, I know. We know all about it. Jade removes her helmet. At the sight of Jade, Bones' face drops, and he begins to charge towards her in what looks like could be an attack. Oh, 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 big boy. What you doing? But at the last minute, turns into a hug, and he scoops her up into the air. Uh, uh, oh, 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 all right. All right. Jade, you dumb limey. I thought you were dead for sure. Oh, well, here I am. Could you, could you put me down? I can't breathe. Instead of putting her down, he holds her at arm's length midair to get a better look at her. Oh, all right. Very large, man. Goodness. Good to see you too. I thought for sure when I, when I saw the dagger. <sighs> I'm just happy you're all right. Thanks, yeah, he took that, didn't he? But I, uh, I left him with a little present, didn't I? Did you see his eye? Lack thereof, you mean? <laughs> was that your handiwork? Yes, it was. Nice one. Theobald, you are still looking outside. Stalking to Bones' plane, tapping it with a long black cane is what looks to be Sir Oliver Cromwell with a bright yellow eye playfully throwing the propeller a few times before giving you a curt wave. Theobald stares across the yard into the yellow eye until Cromwell departs. With a slow, slinking posture, throwing the cane over his shoulder and walking lazily back into the woods, the disguised Rakshasa retreats. For now. Right. Theobald does a quick spin 180 degrees and addresses Bones. Mr. Mahoney. Bones drops Jade and turns. Oh, oh, all right. I have been a colossal fool. I was headstrong, single-minded, and I ignored your counsel after you had secured yourself a place as one of my most trusted friends. And while I do hope you can forgive me, I do not need you to. But all the same, I'm glad you're here, old boy. And Theobald extends a hand for Bones to shake, should he so choose. Well, I can't say it's not good to hear you say that, Doc. But if you want my forgiveness, you're damn well gonna have to earn it. And Bones shakes his hand, starting with that damned demon out there. Theobald allows himself a measured smile. You are a far wiser and more graceful man than I, Bones Mahoney. All right, no need to be patronizing. Oh, no, I was being serious. Nickelback suddenly wheels into the room. Fitzroy? That's Roy to you, you old... Oh my God, you are old. Yes, thank you for your astute observation. You look like reheated shit, Nickelback. Nickelback wheels forward with a smirk on his face and leans in for a friendly handshake. Bones stoops down to his level and reciprocates. And Nickelback whispers under his breath, If you ever strike Sir Daringcroft again, I will kill you in your sleep. You look like an accursed man. Let's fix that, shall we? Bones moves past Nickelback, unperturbed, and with a clapped hand on his shoulder, sends him flying across the room. Ooh, Nickelback! So, it was a curse after all. I thought I felt the familiar tang of a curse. You know, I haven't slept since Missoula. The next morning, Bones, you awaken, and for the first time since your encounter with the Rakshasa, you have a restful sleep. Your nightmares about being buried alive in a tiny wooden space, suffocating, crushed by dirt, finally cease. After a forlorn shave, staring at your haggard face in the mirror, you join Theobald and Jade in the Arcadia room. Towers of books, stacks of papers, strings connecting many pages that have been ripped out of other texts, and a steaming pot of tea sitting on an ottoman. Bones trods into the room, still drying his now clean long hair, wearing a robe that's just a little too short, with Theobald's family crest emblazoned on the chest. Oh, good to be down to just the soup strainer again. Well, you certainly smell better. 
Yes, don't you look smart? Hey, thanks. Bones looks at the pot of tea in slight disgust. You wouldn't happen to have any Joe, would you? Nickelback wheels in with a pot of coffee. Of course, Leroy. I have your coffee prepared. Nickelback puts the coffee pot down next to a mug, gives Bones a withering look, and then wheels out of the room. Do either one of you want to taste this coffee before I get in there? It would be my singular honor. Theobald pours a little dram of coffee and downs it. Bones watches him intently to make sure it wasn't poison. Tastes quite poison-free to me. And bodily fluid-free? That old bag didn't spit in it or anything, right? Quite. Enjoy, Mr. Mahoney. Bones fills his mug and walks over to examine the crazy board that they've made. How long have you two been holed up in here? Two years. And, Mr. Mahoney, I understand that you've been on quite the journey from the USA. From my uh, very spiffy digs. By the way, I was doing incredibly well when the uh, hayman found me. Real titan of industry, uh, pillar of my community type jazz. Yes, I'm sure. Jade looks on, shaking her head. Like I said, I understand you've been on quite the journey, but I trust you've heard about Franz Ferdinand? I heard through the hobo grapevine that some hungry guy got shot. Is that what you were talking about? Don't you mean the titan of industry grapevine? Oh, uh, yeah. Right. Austrian, actually. He was killed four days ago. My research has led me to believe that he is one of the possible linchpins for the great war that is coming. The one I was so obsessed with stopping that I unleashed that thing out into the world. Any day now, European countries and Russia will start declaring war on one another. We are on the brink, old man. Speaking of that thing, how is it that it can't get in here and slit all of our throats? A gift from our friend Archibald Pennyweather from down the way. I would hardly call that man a friend. But yes, it's a protection spell of sorts. The few times we've been able to leave Bravegate have only been by the grace of a secret tunnel we've dug. And these. Theobald opens his shirt a little bit to reveal a sapphire necklace like the one from the message to Jade. So it's allergic to gaudy jewelry? <laughs> I kid, what are those? These are Nepalese charms, said and thus far proven to thwart a demon's most common practices of locating its victims. Bloody handy if I do say so myself. Locating its vi- Oh, have, have either of you heard from Vanya? It was trying to get Vanya's location out of me, but I have no idea where the hell he is. That brings us to our next item on the agenda. I was about to ask you if you'd heard from Vanya. Last I'd heard, he'd gone to Chile to be with Miss Withers. Ah, uh, Subby and Vanya. A match made in hell. Well, I've had about as much contact with Vanya as I have with the two of you. So luckily, old Hayman couldn't get anything out of bones. Oh, yes, are you calling him Hayman? His name, uh, one of them anyway, is Hayman. Yeah, that's why I'm saying, Hayman. Yes, Hayman. Gov, has it ever worked for you? He still calls you a doctor. Your guys' accents are so funny sometimes. And you, Bones, did you ever get round to marrying any of the women you said you would? This actually is a pertinent piece of information. If you don't mind, Mr. Mahoney, is there anyone close to you or who might know of your current whereabouts? Yeah, anyone on the grapevine? Well, that's for my journey here. Hobo Code's got me covered. And, uh, well, let's just say the last few years on the ranch weren't exactly the most social of my life. I am thrilled to hear it. I, not because I wanted you to be lonely, but I am happy that there is no one through whom Heyman could reach you. We have already had to move Miss Pickett's family to the country and all of her children to a secret location. You had kids? With who? All right, well, don't sound so surprised. Like, it's completely out of the realm of possibility. Well, you said all of your children. How many kids could you possibly have had in six years? 32, sir. Oh. 32! You, you, you're you just confusing him more and his head's Mr. Mahoney, you... In sets of triplets or what? Bones looks Jade up and down in terror and awe. If you look at me like that one more time, I don't have children. I bought out the old orphanage where I was once brought up and uh, they was living in me house. And uh, all was grand and everything, but once the Rakshasa got wind of it all... I just thought it would be unsafe for the little ones, so they've been moved to a uh, secure place. Theo tells me, anyway. Phew! <laughs> that was, uh... That makes much more sense. 
Here's the thing. We've got some information. We've got some leads. We've been working hard since we can't bloody leave this place. But I think we need to find our man before we can get to it. Don't you think, Gov? Quite right, Miss Pickett. You see, the three of us have had the misfortune of facing the Rakshasa alone. And going up against him that way, it's not even a fair contest. And right now, Vanya's alone. We have a much better chance against him altogether. Speak for yourself, Doc. I gave him the old one, two, three floor, if you know what I mean. You, you hit him with your, with your hands. You were able to do damage to Haman barehanded? But how? I have a theory about that. Uh-oh. Do enlighten us. Bones holds up his two scarred over meat hooks and moves them back and forth in the light of a nearby lamp. As Bones moves the knuckles, there is a refraction of light as hundreds of tiny shards embedded in Bones' knuckles reflect that light. I think it's got something to do with that giant eagle statue I punched in the city of Mears. Theobald's eyes go so wide his monocle falls out, and he dashes over to his desk and grabs a magnifying glass. He rushes back over and holds it over Bones' hand. Astounding! Mr. Mahoney, I think you're quite right. There must be minuscule, tiny shards from the city of Mears embedded in your fists, causing any pugilistic damage you do to be magical. Absolutely fascinating. Do they hurt you? Bones looks down at his battered knuckles absentmindedly. Every time. Especially that eagle statue. It was made of glass and stuff. Theobald, giddy at his new discovery, puts his monocle back into place. Nickelback wheels back into the room. Sir, the wyvern has been refueled. Capital! And, uh, vestments that might fit Mr. Mahoney? Bones looks down at the much too short robe. Oh, sorry. It would seem Glenroy left some of his vestments aboard when he left last. Splendid. Uh, sorry to ask this question, but, um, how exactly is our, uh, old man on wheels going to go up and down into the cockpit? Oh, Miss Pickett, um... I do not think I shall be joining you on this venture. Oh. Roy. Oh, really, old boy? Yes, sir. I suppose I presumed you'd thought of something. You always do. Yes, sir. It's just that my mobility of late has been restricted. Um, My knees have gone, you see. Finally, something we can relate on. Let me leave Alexandria with you at least. No, no, sir. You shall need her, I think. Someone must look after you if I can't. Theobald looks at his oldest friend. You're sure you'll be quite all right? Oh, yes, sir. We knew this would happen. It would seem after a lifetime of aging together, I have taken a bit of a lead. Yes, it would. Do be careful. I could say the same to you, old boy. Oh, go on and have a hug or something. Theobald bends over Nickelback's chair and almost lifts him out of it with the strength of the hug. I'll see you soon, sir. Theobald picks up his cane from the Krugraskoshi, now affixed with the head of a bird of prey instead of a wolf. And a few seconds later, there's a fluttering from down the hall, and Alexandria the Osprey settles on Theobald's shoulder. Very good, sir. Let me bring you all to the tunnel, and from there you shall be able to access the garage. Nickelback leads the group down towards the wine cellar, where he gestures for them to go inside. The three of you walk down the stairs. There is a large steel door ajar and an immaculately carved tunnel that leads underneath Bravegate Manor, winding towards the side lawn that houses the garage. The tunnel is lit with small lanterns, and eventually all three of you reach a ladder, above which is a trap door. Quickly scaling the ladder and throwing open the door, you reveal the interior of the garage that houses the massive, ahead-of-its-time, bomber-style aircraft. The Wyvern, still covered in dust. Its water landing gear folded up along its side as the wheels rest on the ground, immediately evokes a sense of nostalgia. Bones walks up to the plane, running one hand down the length of its body, back towards the on-ramp. I missed you, girl. He heads in and throws on his old clothes before going to the cockpit and reacquainting himself. Jade walks up the ramp and stretches her arms. Oh, 
gotta say, I'm happy to be moving from one enclosed space to another. <sighs> now, now, Miss Pickett. The Wyvern isn't merely another enclosed space. She is a fort. A fort in which, through hardship and adversity, we galvanize a bond stronger than Vulcan steel itself. Bond of camaraderie, of friendship, and I dare say that I find it to be a privilege to- And the wyvern rips on. Bones leans out of the cockpit window. Move your cabooses, slow folks. We gotta get to Vanya before the Hayman does. Jade walks over to a seat and straps in. Theobald does the same. In the cockpit, Bones begins the pre-flight checklist, flipping switches and kicking the plane into gear. The propellers begin to spin rapidly. The wyvern starts to move out of the open garage and trundle over the long, wildly growing grass. Bones, from the cockpit, you see Nickelback seated in a wheelchair, one hand up against the glass, looking worriedly. As you turn left, the plane begins to bump along the yard, and as it ascends, make a piloting check. 26. Flawlessly, the massive plane gains altitude, flying over the treetops. There is no sign of Haman as you depart, and soon the wyvern is above the sea of gray clouds, the sun shining on Bones' face. Oh. Hey, you beautiful listeners. It's your old pal Nick here to talk about the Hero Club Patreon. If you're loving what we put out there, think about skipping a coffee once a month and supporting the podcast instead. As Patreon members, you'll get access to our Discord, where you can interact with us on the daily about D&D and anything else you want. You get the episodes a day earlier than all of your non-patron friends, and you'll get to listen to our weekly Patreon-exclusive show, Members Only, where George, Dylan, Marty, and I interview other cast members and each other about specific seasons, characters, and kind of just whatever. So what do you say? You ready to join the club? Head to patreon.com slash hero club to sign up today. Two days later, after flying clear across the Atlantic Ocean, over the Amazon, and around the coast of Chile, the wyvern sits floating on open water at a familiar dock. Bustling workers move giant crates back and forth, transporting massive barges full of metal. Most commonly, this metal is tin. And in some cases, beautiful rainbow bismuth squares make their way clutched carefully by a couple of workers wearing thick gloves. Subby's dock is back in business, and business is booming. Stepping up onto the wood, taking your things with you, who should come and greet you at the dock but Subby Withers herself? Subby is wearing a silky scarf wrapped around her head, along with a two-piece linen lounge set, both in deep purple. The gaze in her eyes is still sharp, though the rest of her is a bit softer. Why, hello there. It's been a while since I've seen you. Miss Withers! Theobald strides forward and extends a hand for her to shake. She gingerly places it on top of his hand for a kiss. Theobald misses the signal and shakes too vigorously. I trust you remember Miss Jade Pickett and uh, Roy Bones Mahoney? Hello, love. Subby? Good to see you. I always remember you fondly. No one else joining today? No, no one else. Uh, Regrettably, Nickelback is otherwise indisposed. How on earth have you been? Good. Today is good. Maybe we can walk around my garden and I'll show you. Yes, I would love to see the garden. The group heads down the dock, enters the industry town that borders the beachside, and after passing a few very busy-looking warehouses, sparks flying, gears grinding, you reach perhaps the largest warehouse of them all. The door is locked with chain and padlock. Above the door, seared into the metal, are the words, the garden. Welcome to my happy place. The chains fall to the ground as Subby takes a big key to unlock the padlock, and the doors open. Inside are piles of wretched-looking metal, twisted and formed into abstract shapes. Canisters of oil, a pile of discarded burned wood. But then, 
as you move a little deeper around this refuse, the twisted metal stops being so abstract. The shapes become a little clearer, more intentional, and more obviously artistic. As you can see, the front was my experimental phase, something that I threw together while I was still figuring out what the garden meant to me. Here is where I started to have a little more fun, but it's still my dark period. There's more tin, more bismuth, more anger. But happiness, but angry. Kind of a reclamation. Bones tentatively walks over to what looks like a scrap metal bust of Vanya. As he walks around it, he notices a small lever with the writing, twist me on the side, and he does. Two small jets of fire blast out of the Vanya bust's eyeballs, maintaining a steady pressure. Whoa, Bones looks back at Subby. The likeness is uncanny. Fantastic, not just his likeness, but also his essence. It makes me think of Aristotle. The aim of art is to represent not the outward appearance of things, but their inward significance. Miss Withers, here you have undoubtedly done both. Yes, an interactive piece. Shame. Whatever is the matter? Nothing's the matter now. We made beautiful art, and that's it. Nothing else to worry about. This feels like a past tense sort of situation. Emma, uh, where is he? Subby throws one of the ends of her scarf over her shoulder. He doesn't live here anymore. <sighs> Subby, you didn't kill him, did you? No, I did not kill him. I would never kill him. Like, I would never kill you. Or you, or you. You all live. Uh, well, do you know where he is? Well... We're sort of in a... in a rush. I don't know where he is, and I don't know who he's with. Maybe Tesla? Maybe someone else? All he could talk about before he left was radio waves and magic. And destroying magic. Why would you want to destroy when you could just create for the rest of your life in peace? Well, Mr. Baranoff does have a sizable chip on his shoulder when it comes to the arcane. Have you got any idea where he might have gone? No. Wherever he went, it was to follow his obsessions in peace. As Subby says this, she stares forlornly into a metal statue that mimics the Venus de Milo, caressing it with one hand on its cheek. Theobald, the name Tesla strikes a chord with you. Roll a history check. 21. Nikola Tesla is extremely well known for his advancements in the study of electricity. You recall hearing during your two-year stay at Bravegate Manor a bit of outside gossip. The Nobel Prize was being fought over by the likes of Tesla and a man named Edison. Miss Withers, you, you said the name Tesla. Are you referring to Nikola Tesla, the, the Croatian inventor? I don't know, and I don't care. Subby's hand goes under the statue's chin, seems to grip something, and she pulls a lawnmower-like cord down and fire lights up the Venus de Milo's back and shoulders. Oh, oh, all right. Well, somebody's really left their mark on you. I'm sorry. I know he loves you. I really do. I could see it in his eyes. And how happy he was to go out and see you after all was done. But he's just not a relationship sort of fellow, is he? Why don't we go sit down and have a cuppa? And uh, maybe you could tell us where he is. Oh no, you don't want to be with him, and I think you're right, you could do better. But we do need to know where he is. Jade, roll a persuasion check with advantage. 20. That sounds delightful. I know just the place. Subby walks you over to a tiny table made of violently twisted metal, though still sort of cute, and then drags a mallet across a glockenspiel, and a couple of her workers wheel out a beverage cart. It's mostly water and beer, sort of intermittently put amongst each other. But on the middle shelf, behind a curtain, is Subby's secret tea stash. Chamomile, matcha, jasmine, take whatever you like. It's been ages since I've had matcha, cooped up in the old manor, you see. And Theobald grabs a matcha tea bag. As the tea is poured, Subby begins staring into her teacup, 
before finally confiding in the party. We were having a lovely time. Everything beautiful. She gestures to the Venus de Milo statue. But then he couldn't stop talking about Tesla. One day, as I was pitching a new project to work on, an installation piece, interactive, bismuth, tin, you know, the works. Vanya burst through the doors and told me that I was wasting our time. This wasn't what we should be using manpower for. Bigger things than art. And that's when I told him he had to leave. That was it. You don't disrespect me in front of my men. Of course not. How dare he? How dare he? What a son of a bitch. Jade squeezes Bones' leg, encouraging him to butt out. Yes, I can't say I approve. Creativity and productivity go hand in hand. I'm disappointed that- Bones kicks Theobald under the table pretty overtly. Ow! Theobald takes the hint from the kick. Mr. Mahoney, would you care to join me for a cigar outside? No, oh, yes, that's fine. As long as it's outside, I think that's a great idea. Just the two of us men away from here. Right, be gone then. Theobald and Bones awkwardly stand up and exit the garden. Do you actually have cigars? No, I don't smoke. Never have. So, you were saying? I couldn't believe he would undermine me like that. Enough was enough. It's one thing to deal with his obsessions in private, but then for him to say it so publicly. And she takes a sip from her tea. Never compromise, Jade. Never. Wise words. Wise words. So where did he run off to, that wanker? Well, I did find these coordinates in his notes. And she slips her a piece of paper. Jade takes the paper gently and folds it into her pocket. I appreciate you. You're an hell of a woman. I appreciate you all and everything you've done for me. I wouldn't be able to have my renaissance if it weren't for you. And so I have something else to give you as well. I've been working on it in case I ever saw you again. Subby leads Jade to the back of the garden. Laid out on pedestals, roughly equivalent with your general body sizes, are sleek, expertly crafted leathers, each with a holster and a shining steel pistol tucked inside. Subby walks up to the armor, showing it off to Jade. What in the good world? It's leather, with flexible steel plate within it. Subby, this is... it's incredible. Just a little something that I whipped up. You protected me, and maybe one day this will protect you. You really are a special person. We will need these where we're going. There is one mannequin that has some for Vanya as well. Um... Can I take these? Jade, roll a persuasion check. Ten. Subby bristles for a moment, but then relents. Sure. I'm not going to see him again anyways. Don't have to put it in storage. Well, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind when I see him. That's for sure. Well, it's been good seeing you all, but I do need the dock space, so... If you could please move out of there as soon as possible, that... Would be great, thanks. My men can help you, yes? Ta-ta. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, yes. Bye, then. She flips one of the ends of her scarfs over her shoulder and downs the tea. Ooh. Great seeing you. Seriously, I, I just, I have things to do. Subby walks up to a mounted machine gun facing a wall, throws her teacup up in the air, and shoots it with a machine gun, and continues firing into the wall. Sure, yeah, oh, good. Well... We cut back outside of the warehouse, where Theobald and Bones are waiting. Theobald throws a stick as high as he can into the air. Alexandria darts by and catches it before it hits the ground and flies off of it. See? Neat. Just then, Jade comes busting through the door, carrying a huge pile of leather and metal. Right, boys, it's time to go. She's on a time crunch, so let's make haste. As they walk towards the wyvern, Jade starts handing out Subby's armor. Oi, Subby made these for us. It's armor, isn't it? You put it under your clothes and it protects you from all sorts of things. This one's for you. This is for for you, Gav. Theobald 
holds the garment out in front of himself. Well, isn't this spiffy? Everybody make an investigation check. 24. Botch. 11. Huh. There's a hard thing in my leather thing. Theobald, you admire the expert craftsmanship. Thin, yet extremely tough metal flexibly moves with the leather as you manipulate it in your hands. Exquisite. This masterwork studded leather armor is perfectly outfitted for each of you. It seems as though it will dampen the effects of both fire and lightning damage, granting you resistance. Well, let's get these on board the wyvern and get going. Miss Pickett, where on earth are we headed? We cut to the wyvern descending on the Castillo Plain in Argentina. An enormous swath of what seems to be dead or dying grass, wilting underneath the brisk temperature, lays before you. As the wyvern approaches, everybody roll a perception check. 12. 18. 8. Theobald, staring out the cockpit window, you start to notice there are impressions in the earth. Over a hillside, you start to see many short dips. Having bartered away the Atlantean earpieces in order to get the necessary materials to demon-proof Bravegate Manor, Theobald shouts over the roar of the wyvern's engine. There they are! The telltale signs of Vanya Baranov! You know, Miss Pickett, for the most difficult one of you to find, as you get closer and closer, he becomes the easiest. You can turn around now, Theo, she says as she finishes buttoning her shirt over the armor that she's just put on. Theobald continues peering out the window at the man-made craters. Yes, it is rather impressive. Bones begins a slow descent down towards the craters. It's difficult to find a spot that is long enough for you to land the wyvern. Make a piloting check. 24. But Bones is no ordinary pilot, and banking the wyvern just a little off to the side, finds a sloped hill, allowing the wyvern's wheels to touch down at an angle before the plane levels out to flat ground. The wings make no contact with any obstructions, and the wyvern comes to a halt. As the door opens and the three of you step out, you stare out onto a field that has been decimated by many explosions. And by the smell of this field, quite recently too. A dirt path leads down to what seems to be a small village in a valley just a ways off. And it passes by, at the very edge of the coastline, a small stone hut. Oli oli oxen free, I found you, old boy. And stepping carefully, makes his way toward it. Make a perception check. 17. You narrowly avoid a mine that is sticking haphazardly out of the dirt. Oh, whoopsie daisy. Everyone, make sure you walk carefully. Remember that Mr. Baranov enjoys his privacy and exhausts every expertise in his arsenal to preserve it. Gov, uh, I just want to say this because I know you're all mush on the inside. Uh, We don't know exactly what we're going to find in there. Maybe he's had a visit from you know who. Yeah, or maybe his noodle's gone all soft. Meaning his brain. Yes, yes, all very real possibilities, and we should consider every one of them. I think moving forward in this endeavor, we should all expect the unexpected. And Theobald goes back to excitedly navigating the minefield. Theobald takes long, high steps, walking a safe path up to the stone hut. Theobald prepares to knock, and then remembers, and... Checks to see if he can. Roll an investigation check. 13. You find no trap. All right, here goes. Theobald politely raps on the door of the hut. Blast, I wish I'd brought some vodka. Vanya, it's Theobald Daringcroft. You can keep knocking, my friend, but no one is home. Appearing behind them is Vanya Baranov. Vanya's usually unkempt beard is well manicured and shaped. His mustache waxed and curled up. He wears black pinstriped denim overalls with a matching bowler cap, along with his usual welding goggles. On his back, you see what looks like a brass back brace attached to two metallic accordion swing arms, one that holds what looks like a large black box, and the other 
that holds a bag with bread. Big Ram! You look... You look different. I, I, uh, I like it. You're going to eat all that bread? <laughs> Welcome, my friends, to Fructovi said. It was my plan, yes, to eat all of this bread myself because I did not know you were all coming. And now that I see you're all coming, I have to share this bread and it is very sad to me. But I can go down to the town and get more bread because that is what towns are for. I am doing very well, you see. I look very handsome, yes? Like Adonis himself, old man. Tell me, am I safe to run and embrace you? And Theobald nods at the ground, which is most likely full of landmines. Bones puts a hand on Theobald's shoulder. Wait a minute. Clean? New duds? Said friends? He might be the Hayman in disguise. Bones, make an insight check. Nat 20. Bones, your eyes narrow in scrutiny, looking Vanya up and down. You realize that if this were indeed the Rakshasa disguised as your friend, this would be a poor disguise to greet you with. You focus on Vanya's eyes, on his smile, and find it to be somehow false. Not as though he is under duress, but as though he is barely keeping it together. Oh, buddy. Bones takes a step towards Vanya and gestures towards the door. You didn't booby trap the door, pal. What's, uh, what's going on there? <laughs> this is, I have learned in my absence from you all that that is not a good way to make friends in a new place. It is inconvenient to de-rig the door every time I have company over, which I have company over all the time now. Oh, right, that reminds me. Jade walks right up to Vanya and slaps him across the face. Oh! That is for Subby, you rotten, rotten man. Also, great to see you. Jade grabs a loaf of bread. She starts to walk into the cabin. Jade! What? Bones overtly takes Jade aside, half turning away from Vanya. Can't you see? The man's going through it right now. As well he should be, letting go with something as wonderful as her. Nobody's like Subby. Let's not pile on. I'm sure he's doing pretty bad all by himself out here, completely alone, making up stuff about how he has company over all the time. Clearly he's by himself, living a miserable, lonely existence. As Jade munches another piece of bread, she looks at Bones. Oh. Little close to home, is it? And she pats him on the shoulder with the loaf. Bones completely drops his attempt to keep Vanya out of earshot. What? I'm not sad. He's the sad one. Look at his sad house. While Bones and Jade talk about Vanya in front of him, Theobald marches across the clearly safe patch of ground and throws an arm around his old friend. It's good to see you, old boy. Quite a lot has happened since you left London. I've so much to tell you about. S sub subby you said you said sub you said subby you what did you say? oh yes we went and saw miss withers why 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 did you do that why? well it was the only lead i had on your whereabouts old man right right of course and she gave us not only your location but some rather flashy suits of armor modern knights of the round table we look like now she even gave us one for you not that you deserve it Look at him! He's so sad! Why are you talking like this in front of him? I'm happy to see him! I, I, I'm just saying, I think he deserves a little talking to about how we treated Miss Subby. Of course, and you've given him the talking to. Now, in the name of group cohesion, could we please... Doc, you're being about as subtle. I mean, I'm not one to throw stones. But as me in a situation like this. I wasn't even going to tell him we visited Subby. Why couldn't we have just shown up here, not mentioned his ex-girlfriend, and all the fancy gifts that she can make because she's so talented? I wasn't trying to. Wait, wait, wait. Did, did she say that it was uh, officially that we are not... Why, why are you... Why are you... Why are you here? I have not seen or heard nary a word from any of you. Because you said you didn't want to hear from us, you ding. Well, surely, if you... If you are sitting here with bones. Have you finally come to my way of thinking? Are you finally here to see what I've been working on? Are we finally going to take it to the arcane? Are you talking about going to war with magic as a whole concept? And this is why she left. 
C- quit saying stuff like that, you ding! Well, we're not quite going to war with the arcane as a whole, but we are about to face an enemy with more magical power than anything I've ever seen. Vanya tries very hard to shake off his thousand-yard stare. All right. All right. So, there is magical will in the foot, and you'll need Vanya the Ram better enough to make big boom in the heart of being and kill it. That is all I need to know. Vanya looks to Jade and really sees her for the first time. Tea leaf. Bones. Theo, it is good to, s- to see you all. Even though you have ruined my day, it is nice to see you. Come inside. Come inside. I have more than one cup because I have so many people over all the time. It's okay. Pal, you don't need to keep saying stuff like that. 20 minutes later, we cut to the inside of Vanya's humble home. This small hut is overly adorned with items from the nearby village that go far past homey. Things that Vanya would never use in his life are strewn about the hut. Everything that Vanya truly uses, you can tell, is outside. Everything inside is for show. It looks lovely, old chap. Yes, it all looks very nice, doesn't it? Yes, but why don't you and Mr. Mahoney grab a seat? Miss Pickett and I are about to impart quite a bit of knowledge that we've accrued over the past two years. Yeah, we've been researching, innit? Vanya sheepishly looks at Bones. Well, Bones, you can sit on one of my many chairs and we can sit and listen to what they have learned. Yeah. Sounds nice. Bones glances around at the excess, and then, while smiling at Vanya, sits on a big wool poof. So comfortable. So you've researched. Tell me, all this knowledge. Yes, Miss Pickett, care to start us off? So, Atlantis, it's actually not just one place, is it? It's called... Island of Atlas, and there's many Atlantises. Uh, they're actually Poseidon's prisons. Poseidon's a, a Greek god of the sea. Oh. And before they were prisons, they were once the gateways between Agatha, which is like the place where all things magical happen. So like, so like Big Ram's worst nightmare, and the mortal realm where we are. Precisely, Miss Pickett. There were other gates as well, chaps. The mirrors, such as the one that led us to Edom, the realm itself. Now, this Rakshasa, the one who cursed me, and later, Mr. Mahoney and Miss Pickett. He's gone by many names, but he introduced himself to me as Heyman. Bones leans into Vanya. The Heyman. Ah, the Heyman. They call him that because he can... He's like a hay man who you, he can put no, on different no, wardrobes. No, completely and wrong. be anyone just he wants. Not even close to right. Like a scarecrow. Let's just move on, shall we? Why don't you let the scholars do the talking? Uh, thank you, Miss Pickett. Now, Haman, after acquiring more advanced shape shifting powers from Zeus, bided his time, using the war on the ancient city of Troy as a distraction. He stoked the flames of the war by killing the great warrior Achilles as he was scaling the wall of Troy, shooting an arrow into his ankle with Paris' bow. It was said that Apollo, the god of light, helped guide the arrow as it was said to gleam like the sun on impact. But I remembered my Aesop's fables. Appearances can be deceiving. So we've come to think of that part as a red herring. Wait, hold up. So, but Zeus is like the dad of the gods. Why would Zeus give the Hayman his Hayman powers of transformation? Well, we tricked him, didn't he? He was all disguised as a friend. Oh, got it. Classic Hayman. Now, after Achilles has died, there was this fight within the gods, uh, because they've been openly not like, interfering in the wars. Now, Hayman uses this distraction to disguise himself as Apollo making amends before a council of gods. But then, he steals Zeus's thunderbolt, doesn't he? 
goes back to Troy, burns the city to the ground. People say that in the ruins of Troy, Haman found a secret that allowed him to do what he did next. Gov? Yes, one legend of Atlantis depicts a war between demons and man, led by a general, Haman. Long ago, he led creatures of Agatha into the mortal realm that they might take it for themselves. But the gods found a way to trick Haman, using his own father against him. They struck him down, using the thunderbolt to wound him deeply, and then imprisoned him forever. That's where we found him. You see, his life stands as an ever-binding contract that prevents gods from directly interfering in mortal affairs, meaning they could not step on mortal ground. Although there are many tales about many different gods from many different pantheons trying to circumvent that contract by a variety of magical means. And I hate to say I told you all so. That's around the time you let him loose. He attacked Doc, he attacked Jade and took the dagger, and he almost killed me in my beautiful ranch in Montana. Yes, Theobald turns to Vanya. Uh, since we last saw you, Vanya, he has made several attempts on each of our lives. That's right, we had to get a necklace and a claw and all sorts of things to protect ourselves. It was really something. Oh, I should make it clear that he specifically did not kill me when he had the chance. Haman has made it clear to me that he needs me alive as some sort of a uh, uh, witness, he said, and won't kill me, but he would happily kill all of you. Right, right, right. So, that's all the terrible stuff, but there is hope yet. The city of Troy might have more answers to determine what exactly Eamon's plan is now. And we know Theo is a part of it. And we've also got a lead on an old contact of ours, well, <laughs> Theo's, um, who may have found Zeus's Thunderbolt. Or at least what it's rumoured to be. She wants to sell it at auction in Athens, but we can intercept it, I think. Make her own offer she can't refuse. Theobald excitedly pets Alexandria as he proudly listens to Jade recount their findings. Also, also, boys, a Lathay nearly cut. What? What, 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 what? what were those noises that came out of your mouth, to leave? I learned Greek, innit? Yes, isn't she marvelous? We're going to Athens, lads. Uh, that is, if you'll join us, Vanya. All right. <sighs> So this hay man, the only thing we know of this hay man is what he has done in the past. Yes, Theo. This hay man has used a war between mortal people as a distraction to steal a thing. And lo and behold, a war between mortal people. What do you suppose he is stealing this time, Theo? As I've been saying from the beginning, it is all smoke and mirrors from the truth that I am after. This war is nothing but a farce. Smoke and mirrors it may be, old man, but it's a farce that's going to get a lot of innocent people killed. And whatever he's trying to steal, and whatever he may do with it, it can't be good. Point taken. There is a reason we do not speak Greek anymore. Well, most of us. Podilato! Is that, does that mean thank you? Means bicycle. Well, I'll say this. And this might be a personal matter, so forgive me. But if there is a magical lightning bolt up for auction, I know a son of a bitch who might be there. Are you talking about Tesla? No. The shifty warlock who's taken all of Tesla's notoriety. The Rakshasa? Worse. Thomas Edison. Okay. Well, I don't know about that, but I do know if it gets sold, I don't fancy chasing it all around the world. So let's get there first. Well then, it's settled. It's off to Athens to get the lightning bolt, investigate the ruins of Troy, defeat the Rakshasa, and prevent or stop the coming war. Well, if I do say so myself, that is quite a full dance card. And we've just gotten the band back together. I must say, this is my favorite part.
December, 1914. The frozen wastelands of Siberia. A tall hooded figure trudges forward through driving snow towards the flat face of a cliff. When the figure reaches the wall of stone, they extend a hand forward. There is a purple pulsing on the rock face that shows a complicated circular symbol adorned with various runes, and the stone sinks into the earth. The figure walks forward and steps inside, pausing for a moment as the stone closes behind them. The hood of this figure lowers to reveal a mane of black tangled hair, which joins together in the front of a massive, unkempt beard. Someone is here. Grigory Rasputin is suddenly bathed in red light as he readies devastating magic. He walks forward slowly, deeper into the tunnel. You have come a long way to die. Show yourself and I shall grant you a swift end. Rasputin enters a more empty chamber, at the center of which sits his black pyramidion of Dashur, a pyramid cap inscribed with hieroglyphs. Necrotic magic radiates off of it, and it begins to slowly light the room with dim light from the floor up. As the ground becomes illuminated, he sees dozens of dismembered cultists lying in pools of viscera on the floor. And as the light pans upward to the far side of the room, he sees who is sat in his gilded throne. What are you, creature? I warn you, I will not prove as easy to dispatch as my loyal servants. Grigory Rasputin, I am Haman. I've come to return something to you. Haman reveals the black blade of Horus's knife. Ah, you have my gratitude, Hymon. My knife was stolen from me several years ago. Your knife? Mortals. So presumptuous and self-important. I'm afraid you are mistaken, kid. I am no mortal. Oh, I am aware of your condition, Grigori. If you would call your wretched undeath immortality, then perhaps I was wrong. Perhaps there is nothing else I can offer you. Rasputin releases the dark energy he had been holding at the ready. And now, Haman, you have my full and undivided attention. Haman smiles a wide, sharp-toothed smile. Good. We have much to discuss. The war is about to begin. And it will truly be something to behold. Daring Croft's explorers will return in Tomb of the Beholder, coming later this year, 2024. This has been a Hero Club production. Produced by Nick Williams, George Primavera, and Jack Quaid, with associate producers Marty Abbey Schneider and Dylan McCullum. Voice acting by George Primavera, Nick Williams, Marty Abbey Schneider, Dylan McCullum, Lelia Symington, and Jack Murphy. Overture composed and produced by Matthew McCullum. Subscribe to our Patreon to support us for the cost of just a coffee a month and get access to our weekly interview show, Members Only. Plus, Follow us on Instagram at Hero Club Podcast, on X at Hero Club Pod, on Twitch at twitch.tv slash hero underscore club, and check out our website, heroclubpodcast.com. Thanks for listening, and welcome to the club. Just then, Jade comes through the door, caroling. Caroling. <laughs> caroling. <laughs> 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 Here comes a wassailing on the leaves so green. <laughs>